Coming up on Tech News Today, how the president plans to protect privacy, possibly through alliteration. Sanjay Jha out at Motorola and get Windows 7 with Microsoft Office for cheap on your iPad now. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, February 23rd, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by GoToMeeting. Get better connected to the people you depend on for success. For your free 30-day trial, visit GoToMeeting.com, promo code TNT. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Sarah Lane. I'm Aya Zaktar. I'm somewhere back here. Sorry about that. All right. And uh, joining us uh, today is Brian Brushwood. Host of Scam School, NSFW Show, Frame Rate, Game On, and Magician About the Country. Yes, I'm a magician about town. I will magish all over you. Yes, he's magished over all of us at one that point. That didn't sound right. I or probably another. should not have said that. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, the people on the podcast don't don't realize what you were talking about, but our countdown that we do on the live show was the Happy New Year countdown. It's like Happy New Year's in February. Maybe it's Chinese New Year. This could be the beginning Pretty of close. our fiscal year. It is. Happy New Year it, to our all. Our fiscal news year. Our, <laughs> yeah, our, right, our right. news school year. Uh, Jason Howell off today, so uh, give Ayaz a break. He's running the board over there. He does this like once a year. And this is a big mistake. That's why it's a new year for me. <laughs> Let's start off with the uh, hot news out there. Google tipped to replace Sanjay Jha as CEO of Motorola Mobility once that merger gets approved. It still needs to be approved by China, Taiwan, and Israel, but the two other big ones out of the way, Europe and the U.S., three people familiar with the matter, according to Bloomberg. I thought that was hilarious. They didn't go with that's, just that's people responsible familiar. responsible journalism. That's triple redundancy, Tom. Right. That means there's no way this could be false. Three people familiar with the matter said Google is close to naming Dennis Woodside to run Motorola after the acquisition is approved. Woodside has led Google's ad sales in America up until last September when he was transferred to overseeing the merger. So he's become very familiar with Motorola throughout the merger process. Uh, Sanjay Jha would then, I guess, be out uh, in just counting his millions. Is there, uh, is there uh, like, did, did, did Sanjay do badly? Did no, Sanjay did well. I mean, a lot of people think Sanjay is the reason Motorola was worth buying in the first place. Uh, yeah. After the split of Motorola into Motorola Solutions and Motorola Mobility, uh, Sanjay Jha sort of spruced the place up quite a bit. Yeah, in a way, sometimes this happens. It's not as if somebody's uh, unhappy with Sanjay Jha. It's more of him saying, I did my part. I don't really want to work in this new structure. You're right. And I'd rather, yeah, go to the beach. It may be Sanjay saying, you yeah. need to find somebody because right. I ain't doing this anymore. Yeah. But does it bring up, if you put a Google person in that position, uh, does it bring up the specter of more collusion and Motorola getting favoritism, especially on the Android platform? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think the perception would go in that direction. Brian, what do you think? Oh, I mean, I, I, I think it's going to be there no matter what. And whether it's uh, the old CEO or the new CEO, I mean, it's like, I, I don't think it really harms it one way or the other. Uh, Christy Wyatt, Motorola Mobility Senior Vice President, also rumored to have been considered. Uh, and Chief Strategy Officer John Butcher uh, also tipped. But it, looked, it looks like, according to three people familiar with the matter, that Dennis Woodside will get the job. Also, uh, Google named former Congresswoman Susan Molinari head of Google's Washington office. She'll become vice president of public policy and government relations for the Americas. She's not only a former congresswoman, but according to Politico, fairly well thought of. She's got good relationships, which is exactly what Google needs in, in the a government. lobbyist. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, she'll manage policy advocacy and government outreach for them in North and South America. Let's move on to some more government stories. Uh, president Obama announced a framework for a new U.S. privacy regulation system. Oh, it's a white paper that was issued and delineates a bill of rights of privacy for consumers. It is expected to lead to some kind of legislation which would give the Federal Trade Commission further tools to oversee companies' use of consumer data. Uh, as I said, the Consumer Privacy Bill of Rights there is the centerpiece. Also in the announcement, but a separate effort, 
The Digital Advertising Alliance was announced. That's a voluntary organization signed up for by 90% of the companies that track behavior-based activity. So Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, AOL, all those folks who are always accused of breaking your cookies and, and tracking you without your, uh, without your agreement, they have all signed up to a voluntary scheme that's separate from the white paper that would allow them to become subject to the FTC's oversight and enforce a do not track system. Now, they're very vague about what that system would be. And Mozilla is over there saying, uh, yeah, welcome to two years ago. We've, we've been implementing a do not track system in our browser for a long time and waiting for people to sign on. Would you like to sign on to that? Now, are we necessarily better off with this being a government mandated thing? And first of all, this obviously, uh, everything we're seeing, this is just the beginnings of the start of a thought at this point. A, a framework means, you know, like, well, this is kind of what we're what we're thinking about. Are, are we better off with the with the government implementing it because of, of why? Because it would be all the same and you wouldn't have this kind of ragtag of everyone having their own idea what new, do not track means. I think people are on two sides of the fence. I mean, there's definitely the school of thought that government should be government that the internet should be as self-regulated as possible and when the government gets involved then it gets messy and people like us uh have have fewer uh say fewer rights and say overall but then what happens when there's a privacy breach let's say with a company like google that's so big that like me boycotting google is not going to bring down google you know, who do i go to who who you know, what organization can i make a complaint to that will write things that's where the, the government thing, does come in handy the only thing that worries me about and i'm not i shouldn't say the only thing but one thing that worries me about having a government regulated do not track system is that i believe it instills in most people a false sense of security where it's like oh well i said on this one site that i don't want to be tracked so i'm sure i'm relatively anonymous i i kind of liked the fact that People should be terrified every time they go on the internet. They should believe <laughs> that anything they do could be seen by anyone. And uh, and if if it matters to you, then learn to take the appropriate responses so that you, uh, as as we discussed earlier, you know, build a wall so that nobody can see where you're going. Mozilla's po global privacy and public policy lead, Alex Fowler, says he's excited by the White House announcement. We want to continue to see Do Not Track evolve through the internet's tradition of open development and collaborative innovation. Uh, so I think. You know, I, I want to make a distinction between the two sides we're talking about here. The Digital Advertising Alliance, I think, is perfectly fine and avoids all of your criticisms in that it's entirely voluntary. It's companies signing up saying, we're going to do this. Uh, and, and therefore, it engenders a sufficient amount of skepticism on the right side of the consumer to say, OK, you're saying you're doing this, but, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to keep an eye on it and make sure you do. On the other hand, the government coming in and saying, look, there should be a bill of rights. There should be, you know, we should we should enshrine in law the fact that individuals should have the right to exercise control over what data organizations collect for them. That consumers have a right to easily understandable information about privacy. That consumers have a right to expect that organizations will collect, use, and disclose personal data in ways consistent with the context in which they gave the information. Consumers have a right to secure and responsible handling. These, these are just the first half of the so, Bill of Rights. Also, access and accuracy, focused collection, accountability. Brian, do you think, I mean, you wouldn't say, I know you wouldn't say, like, I don't think we should have police because people should just be terrified of being murdered. And then we'll stop the no, murders, no, no, no. right? Because that doesn't make any sense. No, no, so no, no, no. What, could, it, I, could it be that we just need to have this enshrined so that if we do catch a company, we can punish them for it? Because right now it really isn't against the law, necessarily. Uh, well, and that, and that is true. That's a very good point. But I wonder, and you're more the expert on this than me, but... Uh, how is this enforceable in a global internet system? System is this? Does this kind of just balkanize the internet? And it's like there are areas that play by American rules and those that don't. I mean, what what are the real teeth in this? Even if it goes through, uh, what I what I what I want to see is better informational hygiene. I want to see people being aware of what they're doing. Now, if you don't care, if you genuinely don't care about your data and you want to go out there running around without your clothes on on the internet, then I mean that's. Uh, just do it knowing. That's normal, that actually. Just look yeah. at YouTube. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's... that's. We were all born naked, Brian. It's <laughs> that's true. not that big a deal. But, but like, what what does this change for the Internet as a global structure if this is implemented uh, under the government of the United States? Yeah, I, I, well, no, I think that's a really good uh, question. What it does, because of the random fact that browser makers and advertising agencies tend to exist in the United States, is that we set up a good system. And, in fact, there's a cooperation going on with Europe 
that would harmonize the privacy collection laws. They already have very strong laws in Europe. So our our laws would then be consistent with theirs and that would make it easier to implement. And and so, and the the technical part of it is that Mozilla for instance has a do not track uh, system built into the Firefox browser. If Chrome, Safari, Internet Explorer all sign up to do the same thing, then essentially all these advertising agencies now agree to say, we'll put the flag out that, res- or, I'm sorry, we'll respect the flag in the browser that says, do not track me. And you right. have a you have a cons- self-consistent system. But, so here's one thing. Uh, I'm sorry, Sarah, go ahead. It's okay. I, I was just going to say one thing that comes to mind, this consumer privacy of rights has got all of these notes like, you know, customers have a right to be secure when they're when they think they're being secure. They have a right to access information that the company has on them. All of the stuff that all sounds perfectly fine to me, perfectly reasonable. But now what happens with these instances? I can think of Google and in a couple of uh, uh, situations, Google um, get, uh, pulling Wi-Fi data from wireless access points is one from last year or the more recent Google ended up. Um, tracking Safari people thing. online via Safari. I won't even get into the IE thing because that's different. And saying, you know what, that's true. We did this and we'll rectify it. It was a mistake. Okay, well, what if under these new rules, a class action lawsuit um, gets built against Google because Google had already pledged not to do things like this? So yeah, there's some so, gray areas. Go ahead, Brian. Well, I, I was also going to chime in saying right now, I mean, these are good ideas. We like the stuff that we're hearing. But the problem is, is when it's when it's a private solution, you start off small with like what Firefox is doing. And once they're held up, uh, then then all of a sudden it becomes the end thing to do and the other browsers catch on because it's just the one issue and it's just the 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 just what's laid out when you involve the government wh- how would you guys feel about this if let's say this bill of rights was folded into some kind of sopa like legislation to where they're able to all of a sudden pull this you know this uh, you're able to fold legislation in with this kind of thing and that's how you get these kludgy monstrosities that, and that's what terrifies me it's like well, if there's a way to get the same effect and not involve the government then i'm highly in favor of that of course not but i think that is a little bit of a straw man to say well what if they do this if they do that i'll be against that bill Mm-hmm. But these rights that they've laid out in the white paper today, I agree with. And I think that, that those should stand as law. I, I think we still have class action lawsuits. We're having a class action lawsuit over the safari thing right now. Yeah. I don't know that this makes that more or less possible. I think it happens anyway. In fact, it might make it less possible because there's an avenue for punishment where where there isn't now. And you kind of have to turn Right. Companies can't. They yeah. know they can't get around something that they hope no one will discover. Exactly. It makes them more careful about this sort of thing if they know they're going to be held responsible uh, by the FTC. I mean, I, you still lock your doors even though it's against the law to steal things from your house. Uh, right. And so I think Brian's point is a good one. You should still take responsibility for your own privacy. Uh, and if you really want to ensure it, you know, block cookies yourself and run third party systems that erase cookies and use firewalls and all of that sort of thing. Uh, but this this will help companies to behave better. I, I At least I think so. Um, let's move on to T-Mobile announcing they are going to go to LTE. I thought T-Mobile was dead. They could never survive. That's what AT&T was telling us all through the merger talks. But no. Uh, because they got $4 billion worth of Spectrum in cash out of AT&T, because the AT&T T-Mobile merger fell through, T-Mobile USA CTO Neville Ray announced today the Challenger strategy. They will spend $4 billion modernizing their network. They will roll out long-term evolution LTE service in 2013. They expect to cover the vast majority of the top 50 markets in the United States. They're going to spend $1.4 billion just to build 37,000 new cell sites and convert some of their GSM and HSPA plus sites to LTE sites. In fact, they uh, because uh, they'll be able to get some more spectrum, they'll be able to refarm underused 1900 megahertz spectrum to be uh, that's used for GSM and HSPA plus to be used for LTE. So they're going to be able to move spectrum around, in other words, uh, which they couldn't do before. This will also allow them to make use of phones that wouldn't work on T-Mobile's network before because they had these weird megahertz spectrums that they were using. Now they're going to have some advanced wireless spectrum that will work consistently with phones that are built for other systems around the world. Lo and behold, AT&T was exaggerating when they said T-Mobile's only strategy was to get bought by AT&T. No, T-Mobile's other strategy was not to get bought by AT&T. Actually, just give us some money (laughs) to build out our network independently. We'll prefer that. Do you think that they're going to have marketing issues because they've been using HSPA Plus 
and they want to go to LTE, which is clearly faster. But people who have bought into T-Mobile thus far think that they're already using 4G. Well, AT&T such a- has been doing that too, right? Yeah, They've been calling so. it 4G. In fact, 4G is almost meaningless. So they're right. going to have to come up with some other term. Yeah. They're going to call it 4 Lightning. or 44G. Something better than challenger strategy, I 4 think. 4 plus 2G. Uh, yeah, they, they lost more than 700,000 customers in the most recent quarter. That was part of their earnings report today as well. They blamed the iPhone for that. They said, look, we're the, the only lack network of without the iPhone. The iPhone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Did, uh, did they make sure everyone understood that, that the losing of 700,000 customers was not their intended strategy to free up more bandwidth? That wasn't the- <laughs> We blamed congestion. We just couldn't handle 700,000 customers, so we kicked them off. No. Look, the highways are wide open. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I think probably the fact that AT&T looked to be buying T-Mobile had an effect on customers choosing T-Mobile as well. At least a small effect. I don't know how big. Let's take a yeah, quick break. Positive or negative, Tom, before you move on? What's that? Positive or negative effect? Like, do you feel like they oh, don't Oh, no, I think a lot of people said, well, why would I sign up with T-Mobile? They're going to go away. Right. Yeah, either no. they have an issue with AT&T or they just weren't sure how things were going to shake out. Let's take a break and thank our sponsor, Tech News Today, brought to you by GoToMeeting. We develop trust in people by looking them in the eye and seeing into their soul. But you can't do that when you're on the phone. Unless you're using some kind of video phone, some kind of futuristic living in the space age system like GoToMeeting HD. It allows you to conference around the world. You don't have to travel. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't even need a phone. But you have GoToMeeting with HD faces by Citrix. And exactly, you don't even need a phone. You just need to be able to click. I only need a webcam too. It's hard, hard, hard for people to see if you don't have a camera. <laughs> but if you got a webcam and you got the yeah, and you got a mouse... You can do HD faces by Citrix, uh, Citrix, and attendees can see each other eye to eye. You can show people things on your laptop. You can you can gesture, gesticulate. It just makes for a better meeting. Brian, you were telling me before the show you've actually used GoToMeeting to good effect and plan on your book. Well, as a matter of fact, uh, yeah, for those of you guys who don't know, uh, Scam School book comes out uh, three weeks from now on Ooh-hoo. 314, high day. Ooh. And, uh, and uh, it would not have happened if there wasn't the publishing platform, Vook.com. And we had never heard of these guys. And uh, we didn't know what their platform was about or anything. But uh, the way they sold us on it was they put together a go-to meeting and it was amazing to sit there and watch real time as they use the tool to create a book right in front of us and then uh, as a direct result of that uh, it, and i also love the management the fact that you you didn't have to interrupt you could raise your hand and be called on for questions and stuff it's just it's just classy you really get an inside experience of it and, that, and that's why the scam school book's even going to happen so it, it helps build that trust and confidence that makes your meetings go well all kinds of meetings product reviews sales presentations book planning Go try it yourself for free. You don't have to take our word for it. Go to meeting.com and use the offer code TNT. Enter that promo code after you click on that try it free button and you'll get 30 days free. It's go to meeting, G-O-T-O-M-E-E-T-I-N-G.com. Uh, TNT is that promo code. When you click on try it free, you're going to love it. Thanks for your support, Citrix and the makers of Go to Meeting. Let's move on to on live desktop. Online, they're the gaming people, but they're doing Windows. What's up with that? Yeah, so it's funny. We've 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 talked so much this week about is Microsoft going to put out Microsoft Office for the iPad, and if so, what is it going to look like? Is it going to be one up? Is it going to be multiple? Is Microsoft lying when they say that the daily is lying? Forget all of that. Really, if you want a Windows uh, interface on your iPad. I mean, that looks like Windows right now. That's actually uh, on live desktop, which is a free iPad. So app. that's not VNC. You're not tricking me. That's that's on live. Yeah, it's sort yeah, of yeah. like VNC. Yeah, it's just you just sign in, um, and it's a it's an app. It's a free app. Um, it's been around since January, so you can get Word, Excel, PowerPoint, um, and then more recently it updated to also include Adobe Reader for PDFs, and then two gigabytes of cloud storage. Well, today, on live desktop announced on live desktop plus which is all of those things plus what they call gigabit speed browsing using IE with flash capability. Of course, anyone who has an iPad knows that doesn't play flash, doesn't play flash on purpose, but there are certain ways to get around it. Um, this is uh, on live's solution. $5 per month for this access. This is- this is amazing to me. I, I can't believe, I, like, this hit me like a ton of bricks because I already thought on live was a cool idea to bring high-end gaming because I, I'm a big fan of PC games. And, of course, most people don't want to buy high-end PCs because they're very expensive, uh, but they like, you know, the higher-end experience. And that's what they've done for gaming. But all of a sudden, my mind is blown with what's possible. You could do, like, 
super high-end rendering. You could have internet access a, a hundred times faster than what you actually have just virtualized through this. I think this is for five bucks a month. This is a great idea. Now, a lot of people might say $5 a month. I mean, what? I'm not used to paying $5 a month for, for an app. That doesn't make sense. Let's go back to the whole gigabit uh, speed because you might think, well, sure, maybe on live could send something like that out, but I don't have gigabit per second speed on my end. How would it possibly work? The idea is, is that I'll try to show you as best as possible. What on live does is it basically serves you up content, anything that you can access online or Dropbox or Gmail or whatever, as if it was serving you a video stream. And the only video, the only amount of data that it has to serve up is what you can see. So if I'm looking at a, at a website right now, my internet's a little slow, so I'm not really pulling up anything interesting. Let's say I was watching some sort of a video. I'm playing it, like on Hulu.com, let's say, flash video. And I scroll past it, and all of a sudden the video is up the screen, it's out of the out of the frame. On live knows it's no longer within my window. It doesn't have to send me that data. It's so, the same way they do video games. They only mm -hmm. are streaming to you the portion of the screen you're looking at. Exactly. So but you don't have to have a high-end graphics card. Yeah. So if you say, Well, I already have Dropbox as an iPad app, well, that is constrained by whatever your connection is. You might have better uh, results. Well, you will have better results if you're on at least a fast enough. They say you at least need like a two um uh, uh, mm, two megabit per second, two connection. Megabit per second yeah. connection on yeah. your end. Thank you. I almost said gigabit. Uh, that wouldn't be right. Um, on your end to see the good results, but you'd have better uh, results with, let's say, a big file in Dropbox if I'm sending out to Brian, say. Well, I'll tell you, like I, I had a real life version of this because whenever we do scam schools, they, they put together the rough cut of the video and it's usually like seven or 800 megabytes large. And I'm always at hotels on the road where you have terrible, terrible Wi-Fi. So my workaround was I had to use go to my PC to get my office PC to download it to the office PC and then play it on the office PC so I could watch the preview over the crappy connection to the Wi-Fi, this is built in and on purpose. Like, mine well, was a kludge to work around it. That's a really good point. Go to my PC and, and programs like that are actually allowing you full access to your home machine. Mm -hmm. Now, you do have to roll it yourself. There's limits to what you can do with these Windows machines. You can't, for instance, access the control panel. Correct. Yeah, that's actually one... Um, uh one glaring issue, uh, David Pogue had pointed out, he wrote up a, um, a review of online desktop uh, plus for the New York Times, he says, you know, in a real Windows PC, and people are used to this, you can open the control panel to enlarge controls for touch use, let's just say. On live simulated PC is lacking that, so that's kind of an issue. Um, if I pull up Excel here... Um, and open up Excel. It well, looks, that's the thing. You get Microsoft Office. Yeah, no, you do. This with is, a touch interface on your iPad. Exactly, now. yeah. And I mean, what's what's kind of beautiful about it is that this is not some sort of like reimagined version of Windows that people might not even like on the Metro interface. This is Excel as you know and love. However, a lot of these buttons up here are kind of small mm -hmm. and you have a stylus almost might be good in a situation like this sure. because you've got a lot of stuff that you're clicking on and you know so it's, you can only you can only uh, enlarge so much Sarah do you have access to a persistent virtual machine like you can make apps in there and uh, and then you could come back later or you could make uh, documents and you come back and they're all sitting there for you no that's a very good question and that's something that on live knows is an issue like let's say I'm I'm in here right now and I go ahead and I switch to uh, Storify, right? And I'm doing this, and then I go ahead and switch back to OnLive. I have to sign in again. So Now, you could save that document to your two gigabytes of storage. Exactly. So you have to remember to do this. Yes, like, but that's something that like, is going to be inherently an issue for iPad users because we're just used to switching around. And if you spend $10 a month, you get 50 gigabytes, so you got more storage, and you get the ability to install some additional apps, yeah, but it's still limited. Yeah, that's that's coming soon. It's not it's not available as of today, uh, nor is an Android version. So I know a lot of people are already like, eh. Uh, but they say that they're working on all three of those things. Um, and yes, with the 50 gigabytes cloud storage uh, version, which would be $10 a month, um, and OnLive still has some issues to work out is how are people going to be able to run Photoshop on this machine because they'll have to prove that they own it and that sort of thing. But they're working on it. Well I, I, it seems like they'll suss it out the same way that internet cafes do, because essentially this is a virtualized version of just going to, you know, for $5 a month, you have this membership to an internet cafe that you can always reach through your iPad. 
And uh, just as those businesses work out group licenses on a uh, on a, a per seat or a per user basis, I think that they would do a similar thing just virtualized with OnLive. Well, you, you could you could also see where they would strike deals with Adobe and other manufacturers to you know get get uh, rent like essentially renting the the operating system, uh, renting renting the software. Happens. Once once the computers get so much faster, so much uh, better connected to the Internet and with so much sweeter software than most of the crappy PCs in all across America, essentially they're like, yeah, you could go spend a thousand dollars on a new high end system or for five bucks a month. You now have your own virtual machine or on live, which they sell a console for games, start selling a really affordable PC which has to be connected to the internet to work, but gives you full access mm -hmm. to whatever the latest version of the operating system and all the software is. And right. they, they can sell it for $20, you know, and then maybe have a subscription fee on top of that. That's let's, cool. let's finish up with a couple of stories here. Uh, the Pudong District People's Court in Shanghai said in a written statement today that it has rejected a request by ProView to give a temporary injunction against selling iPads. That's huge news for Apple because Shanghai has three of their Apple stores. And if they uh, had lost this request for injunction, Apple would have had to pull the iPad off the shelves. They don't now. Uh, this is just one skirmish in the ongoing battle between ProView and Apple. Next Wednesday, a court in China's southern Guangdong province is expected to hear a, an appeal. Guangdong's court ruled against Apple previously. And uh, the Bank of China and Minsheng Bank, according to the Next Web, actually control ProView. So they are at the mercy of their creditors. That's, it, we think of it as ProView saying, no, you don't have the license to do this in China. Apple saying, oh, no, no, no. We, we bought this uh, from, from your subsidiary in Taiwan. We have the global rights even in China. Hong Kong court agrees with us. Now ProView says China's court disagrees with that Hong Kong court. That's what this battle is all about. But you've got two banks in control. They want money out of this. Yep. But they also probably don't want ProView to lose. They're really pushing hard for a settlement out of court. That's exactly what they want. And they've been very vocal about that, almost where you go, don't you want to hold your cards a little closer to your chest or something? Please, we'd love to sell out of court, Apple. Just give us a lot of money and we can make this problem go away. I don't think that it's... It's not. Hey, the the court has uh, courts have ruled with ProView thus far in certain cases. So it's not as if you can just write them off for 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 being silly. But the fact that they yes are controlled by creditors, they're in serious financial trouble. Uh, that's exactly what they want. They want a settlement. They don't even really want to be doing any of this. Yeah. The the creditors just want their money back. Or and some if of the, it. if these banks decide that this fight is not worth it. It's going to be bad news for ProView because they'll they'll shut it down yeah. right away. They don't have another option. Finally, a proposal by developers from Google, Microsoft, and Netflix would make a copy protection scheme for streaming and downloadable video part of the HTML5 standard. Uh, the structure would rely on what's called a content decryption module, or CDM, that would operate independently of the browser. Might be in hardware, might be a firmware thing in the in the BIOS or the EFI. Uh, and with the CDM in place, a company could then send a key to decrypt a given portion of HTML. Uh, there has never been copy protection built into an HTML standard, and this is rubbing a lot of people the wrong way. Google's Ian Hickson. Now, remember, Google proposed the standard, but one of its employees, Ian Hickson, called the proposal unethical and said it did not provide enough content protection to make it worth implementing anyway. Mozilla's Chris Pierce, the makers of the Firefox browser, asked how the proposal would affect open source browsers, which could theoretically be patched to allow people to capture streaming video or audio. Uh, Netflix's Mark Watson replied that hardware solutions could solve some of those open source problems, but browsers would need to stream the content through a protected media pipeline. And that just sounds a lot more complicated than it should be. This is this is a fight that's not going to go away, even if this proposal doesn't get accepted, which it it's questionable whether it will or whether it won't. They are going to have to figure out how HTML5 plays with DRM if they're going to get companies like Netflix and Microsoft and even Google on board with HTML5 as the new standard. I mean, everybody's saying Flash is on its way out. We're not going to use Silverlight anymore. The thing about both of those is they're very friendly to DRM. HTML5 is not so far. 
Well, and this is all, if there's any chance of Netflix ever moving to HTML5, there has to be some ability for something in there, right? And keep in mind, this is not like everything that's HTML5 is suddenly DRM'd or whatever. This is an ability to add, an, what, an encryption, I guess, that would uh, that would satisfy the requirements of all the media content professionals. Now, uh, the, the the only conflict and in the, in the part that's, you know, when, you know, the unethical idea comes up from is the fact that HTML has always been open across the board. And uh, th this DRM capability and understand it's not flipped on, it's not enabled. It's just an ability to have something protected in order to satisfy for, you know, watching online media uh, by having anything proprietary in it. That's what's not going to play nice with the open source stuff, right? It could. Yeah, it could cause license problems because open source software has to have everything that's a part of it be open source in most cases. There, there are ways around it, and there's exceptions to that. Absolutely. Look at Android. Android has some proprietary systems, even though Android at base is open source. Uh, but it does complicate matters. So, I mean, I, I don't pretend to understand the intricacies of what the actual real problems here are here and what the solutions are. But it's something that's going to be fought out uh, and it's going to be fought out very loudly as people this, are, are, it, are diametrically opposed to DRM in the first place. And frankly, it's going to go away eventually. We're going to realize it's just not worth keeping up. But the, the industry that provides the content is not going to provide the content for HTML5 without it, at least in the near term. So it's going to have to be implemented in some way. Can I make some predictions? Sure. I'm going to predict that whatever this capability is will prove utterly fruitless in stopping piracy and that it'll be instantly worked around by, by the bad guys. I'm also going to predict that there's absolutely no way you'll get uh, you know your Netflix licensed content on HTML5 unless they have some kind of imaginary MacGuffin to wrap their arms around and tell themselves that they're going to be okay at night. And that you may be absolutely right. I mean, I think the only the only part about that is you will see, I mean, everybody's abandoned everything else. HTML5 is the future. So you will see them come up with something, and we'll, we'll end up following that and seeing what it is later. <laughs> Let's move on to the news views. <laughs> LG showing off their Mobile World Congress plans ahead of time, just like everybody else. What could they add to the L3, the L5, the L7, or the View? How about a new flagship phone? The Tegra 3 powered Optimus 4X HD, which will ship with ice cream sandwich. There's also the 3D Max with a dual core 1.2 gigahertz processor and NFC capability. And that's not all. They also talked up the Optimus LTE Tag, which runs gingerbread, but its hook is NFC that interacts with programmable stickers. Speaking of Tegra 3s, NVIDIA is rebranding its variable symmetric multiprocessing technology within the Tegra 3. Do you not know what that is? That was that technical way of basically saying that the Tegra 3 has four cores along with that other fifth lower powered core. The new name is better. It's four plus one. And NVIDIA says the Five. move is due to requests from its customers who said, what is variable symmetric multiprocessing? I just want that five core one. Well, now they can say, what is four plus one? And NVIDIA will say five. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Let's talk about one of my favorite sites, YouPorn. Oh, wait, I, I thought that said YouTube. Anyway, uh, over 6,000 YouPorn usernames and email addresses were exposed on Wednesday. On the bright side, no credit card data was compromised. The breach occurred at YP Chat, which provides chat abilities to YouPorn. The president of YouPorn suggests users change their passwords and usernames at other sites if they use similar credentials. The same old, same old. YP Chat currently is disabled on the YouPorn site. Samsung has announced that it sold, not shipped, but sold 20 million Galaxy S2 phones worldwide since April 2011. Samsung was the world leader in smartphones, according to IHS Supply, for 2011 by selling 95 million units. After 10 years, Wi-Fi might finally get faster. In advance of the Mobile World Congress, Qualcomm Atheros announced an ecosystem support for 802.11ac. The company expects that access points and user devices that use 802.11ac will launch around the same time later this year. Qualcomm's president of Internet Services, Rob Charndock, says that he expects adoption of this standard to be faster than previous iterations of wireless tech. 802.11ac can 
theoretically reach one gigabyte per one gigabit per second. Sorry, not gigabyte. <laughs> the Wireless Broadband Alliance completed trials to make connecting to Wi-Fi hotspots a lot easier. A new class of Wi-Fi hotspots will use SIM cards to connect to the access points. That also means no more inputting usernames and passwords just to join a network. It also allows wireless carriers to offload traffic onto existing systems of Wi-Fi networks. The peering wars are heating up in Korea. Kim Taewon, vice president of KT, Korea's largest ISP, said that his company is tired of the free-riding internet streaming services that consume huge amounts of data and don't pay a dime to access our services. Of course, like many carriers, KT ignores the fact that these streaming providers are paying big bucks to get on the internet in the first place and provide the value that make people want to subscribe to KT's services in the first place. KT has already blocked access to applications available on televisions like those from Samsung. Expect Korean internet users to possibly switch to Hanaro, ThruNet, or Dreamline in droves. Video is what everybody wants to use on mobile, though. Mobile analytics firm ByteMobile announced their quarterly report that mobile video now accounts for half, half of all mobile traffic. And on some networks, that number is even as high as 69%. Also, Android's hoarding the ad money, pulling down 75% of ad-generated data across all platforms. So is that data throttling that's all the rage among all the wireless carriers effective? Well, a company called Validas took data from more than 55,000 cell phone bills from 2011 and decided to try to find out. Here's what they found. There is virtually no difference in data consumption between those in the so-called top 5% of usage of unlimited plans and those who pay for tiered plans. In other words, being tiered doesn't slow anybody down. Uh, of course, the carriers could argue that they make more money on the tiered plans, which allows them to build more capacity. So that's why they do it. Let's move on to the randomizer. Let's. Randomizer. All right. One of the biggest frustrations, it's a first world problem I know, is <laughs> trying to put that USB cable Stop, don't in, downplay this. into this the USB like slot. And having it be the wrong side. Now, I know that the little USB logo is supposed to go up, but even so, sometimes you can't see it. And you're like, do I have it right? Do I have it right? Brian, Brian, you seem to be very passionate about this cause. Oh, are you kidding me? This is the real problem. I've, I've wasted, like, if you think about, I say, I mean, easily half the time I plug it in and it doesn't work. And then sometimes, like, it gets jammed on the bezel and you think that you put it in upside down. So then you flip it over and now you are putting it upside down. Then you go back to the first one again and you put it back again. Look, I, I would say I have lost uh, three man hours in the last year just trying to jab a USB thing in there. And if they're going to fix this, then hooray for America. That's this is the greatest thing ever. I'm going to start a band called Jammed on the Bezel. Uh, yeah, so the, the Buffalo Kokuyo Supply Company has announced they will release a USB hub sometime by the end of February that doesn't care what side is up. You plug it in, it adapts. And it says, we'll, we'll accept that USB plug any way you want to orient it. Oh, man, so this isn't like a USB standard. This is just one hub? I thought we were going to fix this for reals across the board. No. It's just you a hub, but it comes in black, steps. pink, and blue. Small steps. Yeah, baby, baby, baby USB steps. Uh, <laughs> it's going to sell for 1,806 yen or 23 bucks. So it's pretty affordable, too. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, sign me up. it's a cool little USB hub. Yeah, why not? On to the calendar. Well, the Apple shareholders meeting provided quite a bit of nothing, actually. There was no <laughs> news. Uh, the shareholders reelected the company's board of directors. Uh, by a large margin. Uh, the company didn't announce the dividend or share buyback. Uh, a lot of investors had been calling for that. Tim Cook even said, I'd be the first to admit that we have more cash than we need to run on the daily business. And he needs to figure out what to do but with it. But you can't have any of it. We're just, we've got so much money that's coming out of our ears. I will think of something. This was Tim Cook's he, first shareholder meeting. Correct. And then he replaced his monocle, tipped his top hat, and rode a <laughs> champagne buffalo right out of the room. Yeah. And got a, a bonus. Uh, the <laughs> Asus Transformer finally gets its Android 4.0 update. Yum, yum, yum. That tastes good. The over-the-air update is rolling out starting today. Samsung Rugsby Smart is officially coming to AT&T March 4th for $100. 
And finally, Microsoft has announced a few new product lifecycle policy changes. All right. Windows XP will be supported until April 8th, 2014. Windows Vista will be supported until April 11th, 2017. And Windows 7 will be supported all the way through January 14th, 2020. Wow. Yeah. Wow, Windows lasts They're forever. really now. thinking long. Looking long. I believe we have something incoming. Incoming message. It's an incoming message. Oh, uh, yeah. We have a couple of voicemails today. First one is about the Google glasses, the heads-up display glasses. Brad from South Dakota. Um, love the show, first off. Uh, this is in response to the Google glasses, the uh, heads-up display glasses that was mentioned in the last show. If it is true, which I highly doubt, um, why not just tie it into your Android phone as was suggested? Android already has a USB capable uh, port and able to input and interface with other devices outside of the phone. It just makes sense to have all the video and uh, information just go right through your phone. That way you're controlling it with, the th with your thumb in the pocket or wherever. Just a suggestion. Love the show. See you guys later. Uh, Brian, do you agree with this guy? Do you think he's? Do, do you think? The, I, first okay, of all, he well, says he doesn't believe it's going to happen. I totally believe it's going to happen. Second oh, of all, he wants a wire coming down from the glasses to your Android phone. I mean, that almost sounds like Rim saying, "Yeah, you've got email. You just have to tether it to your BlackBerry phone." No, no, no. Actually, physical tether is silly. And and uh, if, uh, maybe if that's the only possible way to get the bandwidth on there, but surely they could do some kind of low resolution over Bluetooth or something to, to communicate wirelessly. I do agree that everything should run from the phone, but you were saying these Why? guys... Why should it... Ha I mean, I think it would be cool that it could run from the phone, but I don't think it should have to run from the phone. I well, think you why, should be able to I, buy the glasses and use them without having to buy a, a separate phone that works with it. Mm -hmm. Well, why? Because you want another 3G account for your glasses now? It's like it's bad enough that the iPad doesn't tether nicely with the with the. Why iPhone? can't it be like the Kindle where the 3G is just built in? It's part of the price of the operation. Well, because you're going to have more data than... than Not you know, for a little just, glasses that's just a checking every once in a while to see like, oh, what's around? Oh, wait. Now, okay. Not now that's streaming true. full it's, motion video. If there's like a whisper net that could check my, if I could set up like a heads up display that did my Twitter, my email alerts and all of that stuff coming in, that would be, that would be rad. But I would love more capability if, it, if there was some kind of connection between the phone, then all of a sudden it can access the rich media in there. I could stream my, uh, my audio books while I'm driving the car and then all of a sudden an alert comes up or whatever. But uh, probably shouldn't mention that I was intending to drive a car while wearing these gloss glasses. Never mind. Pretend I said nothing. <laughs> All right. Let's get to our uh, next voicemail about Microsoft Office on iPad. Here it comes. <laughs> get ready. Hey guys, this is Julian in Seattle. I have a rumor slash idea um, as we discuss these Microsoft Office applications for iPad and Microsoft's response to the various rumors that they can't say anything, but you'll see something in two weeks. What if they were slated to be one of the big showcase of the iPad 3 announcement in terms of apps, much like a Apple-Microsoft partnership heralded at the time by Steve Jobs and Bill Gates? Wouldn't that be interesting? Anyway, just thought you'd like that idea. Okay. I do like I don't know if, how likely that is. Sarah, what do you think? If Microsoft's going to announce Microsoft Office for iPad... Kind of makes sense to be one of the partners at a new iPad announcement. That would be awesome. <laughs> I hope that's what's going to happen because people's heads will explode. Some people. But... Uh, it's the kind of Apple you know showmanship. To in, be like, in a way, just because I think Microsoft is being... Let's say you assume that, yes, this iPad app is coming and Microsoft is being coy and annoying when they're just denying it because they're like half denying it. Let's just say that they are a partner at, you know, the next Apple announcement. That's almost the only excuse they can use to be like, now do you see why we couldn't say anything? Do you see? This is really cool. Yep. Look at this app. It could work. New Microsoft Office for OS X has often been part of an Apple announcement. Mm -hmm. So why wouldn't it be for iPad? That's a big deal. Yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd love to see that. That would be super exciting. World's colliding! When worlds collide. Along with online. They're already bringing them a together. A lot of good stories to read on the internet. <laughs> All right, that's it for this episode of Tech News Today. Uh, Brian Brushwood, thank you so much, as always. Uh, let folks know of the 72 projects you're involved 
with where they Dude, can find out. Dude, there's only one that matters. I am doing a bunch of silly projects. Of course, game on on Sunday nights. But the only thing I care about right now, and it may be because our deadline is in 12 hours, but the Scam School book is so freaking dope, man. 40 plus videos. It's got uh, like 30 plus thousand words to this thing. It's got audio commentary checks for each chapter, which I've never seen in a book before. There's uh, You're able to see the, the, the setup for the puzzles and then you hyperlink within the document to get to the answers and stuff. I am so excited. It's the type of educational book that you couldn't possibly do anywhere else. And because it's like an iBooks, you could do it on your freaking phone. Scamschoolbook.com. We're going to try to sell a billion of them on um, uh, mm, Pi Day. 314. March 14th. Check it out. You're going to love it. Also, check out our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. That's the place to go if you want to have your voice heard about what stories we cover. You can submit stories, of course. That's the way Reddit works. But you can also vote on stories because that's also how Reddit works. And let us know which stories you think we should cover. We look at it every day when we create our lineup. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web at twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. Or you can give us a call. There's a like 0.01% chance we'll pick up, but otherwise just leave a voicemail 260 TNT show. Darren Kitchen joins us for Liquid Friday tomorrow. We'll see you then.